Hey, Alan Robson here and welcome to another Grizzly Tales podcast. We've got a bit of grizzle, we've got a bit of sizzle, a little bit of everything for you and I hope you enjoy it. A huge thank you to those of you who have gone through to the Robson's World podcast and made donations of, of every kind of size. Thank you so, so much. It does mean the difference between this continuing and stopping altogether. It, it is coming close to that point and we would love to keep it going. The response from you guys has been great. We know you love it. We just need a little bit of help at the moment and we hope that you'll step up to the mark. If you can't afford it, we understand it's tough times. Otherwise, there would be no question about the podcast. So uh, anything you can do, we'd be very, very grateful indeed. It just seems whenever you get somebody who is in charge, someone whose name the world knows, you get flaky pastry. You don't get a firm crust. There's a problem there. They've got issues. And one such man was Joseph Stalin, the Russian leader. Now, you could say cobblers, and you'd be right, because his dad was a cobbler, his uncle was a cobbler, his grandfather on both sides, cobblers. They were a load of cobblers. And for a man who, in fact, instigated the death of literally millions and millions of his own people, he actually studied, initially, to become a clergyman. He wanted to work uh, with the collar around his neck uh, as a clergyman. Now, the only problem in this regard was that he told his friends at the time he thought it was a very good job because Russian clergymen slept with all the most attractive women, even though they're not supposed to. And he was determined to become a priest to get a bit of action, even though he didn't believe in God, which I would have thought would have been a stumbling point. Now, he was only five foot four, bit of a small bloke with small bloke syndrome. He wore boots with two inch heels to try and make himself look taller. And the second and third toes on his left foot were fused together which a lot of people used to say was a sign of inbreeding. We don't know whether that was the case. And he was kind of built in a, in a weird way. Frankly, if he was a Teletubby or if he was a Cabbage Patch doll, they would have thrown him out because his left arm was a couple of inches shorter than the right because he had blood poisoning when he was a kid. He also had pock marks all over his face. That's why he grew his tash so big to try and take your, your eye off the pock marks because he had smallpox when he was little too. Now, for a man who was a mass murderer, he enjoyed joking with people, practical jokes. He would put a tomato on the chair of one of his guests just about to sit down, or he'd put salt in the wine of his guests at dinner parties. And when you realised it was Stalin that did it, you're not exactly going to complain, are you? Now, was he a good daddy? There's a thing, because sometimes the, the worst people on the planet seem to have been good fathers. Well, fatherhood was a skill that was frankly above his head. When his son Vasily started to cry when he was three or four months old, Stalin tried to quieten him down by blowing pipe smoke in its face. And when that didn't do the trick, he picked up the bundle and he stuck his pipe in the baby's mouth. His wife was not impressed. Now, you know he was a uh, Russian leader during the Second World War and he wanted to try and give his troops a bit of a bit of incentive, a bit of a talking to, to rouse them up. So, he could have sent whiskey, he could have sent beer, both were readily available in huge amounts, but he didn't. Instead, he sent several Stalin lookalikes touring the front line while he stayed safely behind the walls of the Kremlin in Red Square in Russia. So, now we've kind of reached the First World War-ish. Let's talk about Benito Mussolini. He was the Italian leader at the time and a bit of a piggy. He used to like his food and he rammed it down. And the problem was, 
he bolted down all of his meals and he said that nobody should spend more than 10 minutes a day having food. 10 minutes max, otherwise you're wasting your life. Now, because he ate so quickly, he ended up with a gastric ulcer and he had that for the rest of his life. And that cut his diet down in later years to mainly fruit and he had to drink milk over and over and over again to try and settle his stomach. He, he drank about a gallon of cow juice a day. And he hated touching anybody. You know, if somebody comes up and you shake their hand or you give them a hug or you kiss them on both cheeks, depending where you're from, well, he hated anybody touching his skin, apart from the ladies. And he abolished handshaking in Italy. And instead, he created the Roman salute, which was almost identical to the German salute, but done in a kind of Italian way. Now, you know, I mentioned that he hated physical contact. Well, not enough to avoid him getting VD and suffering from a, a well, frankly, a bit of a sore point all of his life. And despite this image of a man in peak physical shape, and he always prided himself on strutting about like that, he was prone to long, long bouts of illness. When he first became leader in Italy, he was renowned for wearing a bowler hat. And a lot of other Italians started wearing bowler hats to follow suit. Then one day, he saw Charlie Chaplin wearing a bowler hat. He saw Laurel and Hardy, his favourite comedians, both wearing a bowler hat. And that was the end of that. No more bowler hats. And anyway, it would have fallen off when at the end of his leadership, his own people got their hands on him for misleading them and hanged him from a lamppost where he was shot at dozens of times, hit with bricks and rocks, and it was an unpleasant death. He and his lover shared that punishment together. Okay, Mao Zedong, let's go to China. We'll do that. His schoolmates thought he was just the, the podgy kid who was sweaty and smelly and... Mao Zedong used to pride himself on not bathing for days and days on end. He thought that cleanliness was a sign uh, of you being upper class or bourgeois, and he didn't want any part of that. His nickname at school was Jun Chi, and uh, uh, he was not well liked. That nickname, because of his smell, meant smooth fungus. He smoked. Ah, oh, did he smoke? And uh, if you know your history, you'll know that Mao Zedong led his Chinese uh, communists on a thing called the Long March. And being an absolute chain smoker, uh, in the absence of cigarettes, because obviously if he's marching, he couldn't pop into their shop, he smoked vegetable leaf substitutes and turned all of his teeth black and he couldn't get them white again. So, if you see him smiling later in life, you'll notice he never shows his teeth, he just smiles between his lips. Also, his manners were not great. Not for the leader of a huge country. In fact, a lot of people said when you mixed him with proper diplomats from other countries, he was the peasant among them. Once, in front of a leading American politician, he turned down the belt of his trousers and started to hunt for fleas that plagued him all of his life because he was filthy. You can't talk about a world war without mentioning Hitler, of course. Did you know he was once a tramp in Vienna? Homeless, sleeping on park benches. He did. He also uh, had a, a sign saying that he was a First World War veteran uh, please put a penny in the poor man's hat and he begged on the streets for a while. Uh, his big problem, apart from being a megalomaniac and, and psychopath, he used to fart excessively. And his doctor used to give him a whole range of tablets, anti-gas pills to try and stop him sweeping at every opportunity. And he used to eat them, not one at a time like you're supposed to, three times a day, he would get like 10 in his hand and just crunch them up. 
and they were slowly poisoning him. Obviously not quick enough, but these tablets had strychnine and atropine in them, which comes from deadly nightshade. He also was a cocaine addict. He took a lot of cocaine to ease his stomach pain because you know yourself, if, if you've ever suffered from serious wind, uh, and he used to blow it out in but kind of mixed company and when he was doing his leading his wind was well renowned and uh, also anybody that's been on the Robson's World site and listened to the Hitler special that we recorded in Berlin you will know that he may well have been partly Jewish himself but that's for you to discover if you go to robsonsworld.com. Now, okay, we brought you a few that your nana might have remembered, maybe your parents. Let's go back further to some incredible stories of other leaders, famous people, as I say, flaky pastry. Genghis Khan, he had a link uh, with modern times. One of his descendants, Okia Yukyat, was China's last hereditary warlord. And he didn't die till 1984, aged 84. His ashes were put in the ancestral tomb, along with Genghis, and that's on the Odos Plateau in Inner Mongolia. And Mr. Hukyat, according to the Chinese authorities, was a good communist. Attila the Hun, Oh, doesn't he sound scary? Just say, Attila the Hun. And his hordes used to massacre towns and villages, men, women and children, and he wouldn't think twice about it. And once again, little man syndrome. He was just a little fella, barely over five feet. And he did a lot of horrific things. Now, I'm a great believer in karma. What goes around, comes around. You do a bit of kindness for somebody, it comes back to you. I absolutely believe that with all my heart. And it came back for Attila. On his wedding night, he was in the middle of having sex with his bride, who was only 17, and frankly, a bit of a goer. And an artery burst in his penis. And he died. He bled to death. And his wife was so terrified thinking she'd done something wrong, she just lay there with At Attila, who was frankly stiff inside her, for all the wrong reasons, it was rigor mortis, and she lay there for almost a day, and obviously nobody disturbed him because they all thought uh, he was playing that ancient game of rumpus pumpus, and uh, she was unable to move. She was eventually rescued by some of the the King of the Huns supporters, and she survived, but I would imagine she's a bit sore. Flat the Impaler, oh, we've done, we've done a few visits to his castles in Transylvania again, available for you on the Robson's World website. And he was uh, a king in a place called Wallachia, which is a province in Transylvania, Transylvania meaning the land beyond the hills. It's now Romania. And he got a lot of pleasure, as most people know, watching men, women and children get impaled on the end of a wooden stake. And a lot of people say a sharp stake. It was never a sharp stake. It was a blunt stake. And they would put that up the anus of somebody they didn't like. This is usually about six foot. And they'd put him down on this, ease him down on it, and gravity would force that wooden stake right the way through him, sometimes bursting out of his neck after it's travelled the full length of his innards. Sometimes it would go up into the skull and literally take his head off. Talk about an excruciating way to die. That was it. He also liked things done his way once, a group of Turkish emissaries came to see him, demanding that he obey Turkish rule. The Ottoman Empire was massive back then. The Turks were a superpower. And he 
didn't like the way that they spoke to him because he believed he was king of all he surveyed. So they didn't take off their fezzes when they were in his presence. So he had them nailed to their heads. And once a woman uh, came to his table with her husband to discuss a land issue, because as king he had great power. And the man offered his wife sexually to Vlad. So Vlad ordered him to lie her across a table and eat her breasts while she was still alive. Maybe that's why we call this Grizzly Tales. So just to lighten things a little bit, let's head across to the other side of the pond and I'll go through a few American presidents who... Flaky pastry. They're, they're frankly, not what you'd think. John Quincy Adams was an American president. And imagine a president who loved skinny dipping. Any chance he saw some water, whether it's the sea, a lake, a pond, his clothes came off and in he went. And when the sun went down, he used to slip out of the White House and jump naked in the Potomac River running through Washington. And he'd swim there for an hour or so before getting back out, surrounded by his guards, to get on with his presidential business. Now, George Washington, we already know, uh, was a great man, he did a lot of amazing things, but he had a problem with his teeth. He only had one tooth in his head. All the rest had gone rotten and had been pulled out. So, when that final tooth went and he had nothing to make any kind of impact on his food with, he had a set of false teeth made from the tusks of a hippopotamus. Now, you would think if you're gonna get it done, get it done from a creature that's roughly the same size. No, he wanted hippo teeth. The top and bottom set, because the teeth were so big, couldn't fit his mouth terribly well, and when he had them in, he couldn't uh, couldn't physically open his mouth. So they put a spring in, hinged together, so they would open with a spring, bang, and then snap shut on the springs. As you can imagine, this distorted his lips and gave his face a, a comical look. And the way that he talked, I can't imagine what that was like. But, uh, as I say, even the leaders, as we've known recently, flaky pastry. Abraham Lincoln, a tragic end to him. He did a lot to end slavery. He did a lot for uh, equality and all of that, not knocking a lot of his work. But do you know that he didn't actually believe in abolishing slavery? He just wanted to stop slavery extending to other states who didn't want to have it abolished. And in those states, it was already well and truly established. So he just firmly enforced the Fugitive Slave Law, which made it obligatory to return escaping slaves to the South to face punishment there. Now, that meant technically he was on the side of the Confederates, yet he led a war against them. His advisers misrepresented him and ended up making him look better than he would have. Other presidents, sometimes you maybe have heard the name, but you don't really know what they're about. Let me just give you a call. throw a couple in. Calvin Coolidge. He used to play tricks on his secret servicemen. You know how they're always looked after by people running alongside the car with one finger in their ear. Well, obviously it's their job to look after him. But when their attention was distracted, Calvin would jump into the bushes and hide near the White House. And the guards were panic-stricken because it meant their job if they couldn't find him. And then when they were just on the verge of calling in the special guard, he would jump back out of the bushes and surprise them. A flaky pastry. James Garfield, he was born in a log cabin, a proper man of the people, you would think. 
yet he was able to write Latin with one hand and Greek with his other hand all at the same time. Now, I'm not describing that as flaky pastry, but blimey, talk about being able to do two things at once. He really was. Men aren't supposed to do that. I thought that was a woman thing. GF Kennedy, we know the tragedy. We also know he was one of the men who misused Marilyn Monroe. But do you know he's an angel in the Vatican? Mm-hmm. In 1939, while spending some time with uh, an artist from Poland whose name was uh, Elena Baruch, uh, her husband was an American diplomat, he posed as a model for the painting of an angel floating over St. Teresa. And that work of art ended up in the Vatican, where it remains to this day. And if you see the painting, if you look at the angel above St. Teresa, it's JFK. Again, uh, if you're a fan of the weird, the strange, the bizarre, and some real-life adventures across planet Earth, dealing with aliens, dealing with ghosts and spirits, or dealing with the peculiar. We seem to specialise in that, and that is available for you on robsonsworld.com. Hope you'll go across there and partake. Okay, let's head towards the main course. So let us take a visit to Poland. It's a fine country. I've been lucky enough to visit there a few times. And you can hear some of those stories on robsonsworld.com too. But we have done shows from Auschwitz that you can hear. I've interviewed survivors. We've talked to people lucky enough to have lived through the horrific death camps. And I have a great deal of sympathy for the Polish people in general. However, I'm about to tell you a story about Polish people that I have no sympathy for at all. I want to tell you about a small Polish town that you may never have heard of. It's called Jedwabny. Now, not a special town, quite a small town originally built up with Jewish money from back in the early 1600s when Jewish financiers travelled the world looking for businesses to invest in and they invested here in Jedwabny. It became a thriving and a gentle place to live. Amongst the ordinary people, the Catholic majority of about 60% got on really well with the 40% Jewish population. They often would share ceremonies, markets, weddings. It was a community thing, and they were very, very proud of this wonderful mixed community that they had, exchanging cultural things, enjoying each other's feast days and religious days. However, in the early 1930s, the Polish National Party began to echo the same message as Hitler was beginning to espouse in Germany, and he blamed every single one of society's ills on the Jews, particularly their grasp on local business and industry. And in Poland, they were watching their neighbour, seeing attacks on Jewish shops and factories, and they began to do their own lethal form of skullduggery. At first it started merely rabble-rousing, the occasional broken window, graffiti smeared in paint on a wall. The problem is, when racism starts to infest the simple-minded, it's only a matter of time before somebody decides to cross the lane between unpleasant and downright evil. Now, an Irishman called Martin O'Reilly made me aware of this story when I was hosting my late night radio talk show in 1992. Now, he was obviously an elderly gentleman and he claimed to have been in Poland and witnessed the sick beginnings that would eventually lead to the massacre of the innocents. He told that he was there, and he said, I was there visiting Paula, 
a girl that I'd met in Warsaw in 1932. I was on holiday and she was studying at the university and we had what you would call a holiday fling and both of us thought that would be all it was but I just couldn't get that girl out of my mind. We sent really lovely letters back and forth and she invited me to go over after her studies had ended and she had qualified as a nurse. She was due to take up a full-time job in a small hospital in a place called Colno. So we had three incredible weeks together before that. I worked for my dad doing building work, so I'd taken four weeks off. So she began her new career and I still had a week's holiday and I would see her at her mother's house when she returned. Yet on the second night, she came in with her nose cut and a black eye. And we all asked what had happened. She said, well, a Jewish woman had been raped by a group of nationalists. They had then tried to beat her to death so she could not identify them. Miraculously, she clung to life. Despite broken arms, broken legs, broken ribs, a broken nose, her head split wide open and a bottle had been pushed into her lower body. Paula had tended to her after the doctors had operated on her for over four hours. And then, at about 7.30, when most people had gone home, three men burst in wearing masks, punched Paula to the floor, kicked her in the face and then ran into the poor woman's room and fired five bullets into her head. They raced out and within five minutes the police were there investigating this vicious murder. Paula was quaking, shaking and sobbing all at the same time and whilst she lay on the floor pretending to be unconscious, something that had probably saved her life, she noticed that one of the men had a distinctive buckle on his shoes. She was about to tell the policeman about it when another nurse tripped and fell at her feet and Paula bent down and lifted her up. But as she did, her blood turned to ice. One of the police officers, the inspector, was wearing those shoes. She had the presence of mind to say that she didn't see anything and after 10 minutes they left. When she got home to her mum's, Paula begged me to take her to England, so I swore that I would do my best. She spoke about how people all over Poland had started to spread hatred about Jewish people. Attacks, rapes and murders were becoming common and the police never ever caught the guilty. In fact, so many of the police were Polish nationalists themselves, it gave them the perfect platform to hide their vile assaults on innocent people. All the while claiming that they were the representatives of both Catholic and Jewish communities. On getting home, I made all the calls to organize her travel to Durham, where I was living. We got engaged and she worked briefly at the hospital in Dryburn. I joined the border regiments and my fellow Celts during the war. And one leave, I managed to get back home in time for the new year of 1942. And she told me that three of her Jewish friends, all nurses like herself, had been murdered in a massacre. Now, I presumed that it was just another Nazi atrocity. We were used to hearing about them. Yet she was crying, seeing that it had been carried out by her own people. Now, many Poles had hated the Russian occupation that had lasted around 20 months before the war. They called that a reign of terror. The Russians had been brutal, but life had returned to a type of normality. If you didn't provoke them, they left people alone. So when the Germans chased the Russians out, taking over the role of invader, the nationalist Poles supported their every move. They knew that if the Germans needed someone to administer 
the Polish people, they would be well paid and they would wield immense power. So most of those jobs, those roles, were given to the nationalists, who swore an undying allegiance to the Reich. And they were as vicious as the SS, looking for any reason to prove to their German overlords that they were as loyal and as violent. The ordinary people of both religions loathed them. On one occasion, a little four-year-old boy had run into the legs of an SS officer. A Nationalist Party member stepped out, tripped the lad, then stamped on his head until he was dead, as his mother watched and screamed. When she leaned down over the bleeding corpse of her beloved son, the Nationalist pulled out his knife and slit her throat. The sheer contempt that they had for their own people. Paula cried and cried and cried about it. She wanted to return to help her people, but it was wartime. She just couldn't, not even when her parents were shot dead by the Nazis because they had helped an RAFM and avoid capture. When the Germans searched their house, they found a packet of player's bachelor cigarettes left by the British chap that they had hidden. It was enough for Paula's mother, father and 15-year-old brother to be machine-gunned to death up against their own house wall. The massacre she told me about had led to over 30 other massacres, all carried out by Polish nationalists against their own people. Yet the first one took place at Jedwabny where Paula's Jewish nursing friends were working. The very first Germans had just arrived to occupy the town. The SS and the Gestapo were on their way. So the nationalists wanted to do something to impress them. So the police inspector gathered his officers, armed them and gathered a mob of those who hated or were jealous of the well-to-do Jewish population. That very night, they went house to house, dragging out every single Jewish family. They shot the rabbi, and they burned down the small family synagogue. Men, women and children were dragged, beaten and brutalised. Soon, 304 of them were interred in a huge barn on the edge of town. This was the beginning of numerous massacres, yet they didn't believe any harm would be done to them. They were Polish, and these people were fellow Poles. They were told that their money and their property had been seized, and that they would be forced to leave Jedwabny. They tried to get out of the barn, yet each time they did, those guarding the outside would fire a machine gun at the door, killing and wounding those inside. After an hour or so, they began to settle down in that dark building, some praying, others trying to calm their terrified children. They heard a bumping and a banging from outside, but they had no way of knowing what it was. And it was just as well. The Polish nationalists were pushing hay carts against all of the doors, nailing closed the shutters on windows and spreading thick, black oil onto the walls. Then there was the smell of petrol. At first, those inside thought nothing too much about it, as inside the barn was a tractor and several cans of petrol. And then suddenly, through the thin edges of wood, there was a flickering. All four sides of the barn had been set on fire. And outside, the Nationalists had set up machine guns to murder anyone who tried to escape. This, apparently, had been the dream of the vicious Nationalists as far back as 1931. Now, thanks to the Nazis, they could do it without any risk of repercussions. The SS arrived and they could clearly smell the burned human flesh and they commended the Nationalists for their loyalty. 
Two days later, over 800 Jews would be killed the same way in Radzilov. The disease of ethnic cleansing spread like a wildfire across Poland, and their nationalists had a field day. Many Polish towns and villages had taken a surge of extra-Jewish people trying to escape from the Holocaust. So one by one, the purge and the stamping out of the Jews continued. Nitsin, Gonads, Narovka, Wizna, Rajgrod, Korosh, and then Paola's own town, Kolno. Over 40 families that she had knew well had played with as a child or studied with at the nursing college. Their entire family lines were exterminated. Then, more and more, until the Nazis began to organise their transport by train to their recently built death and extermination camps. In 1945, Shmuel Wajastin was asked to interview survivors of the Polish camps and some remembered the horror of discovering that their own people were selling them out. He wrote, The other brutality was when they ordered battered Jews to dig a hole for the graves for other murdered Jews. Then they would be murdered and the next group of Jews buried them and then waited to die. It was impossible to represent the brutalities of these hooligans. We have no similar behaviour in our entire history. Beards of Jews were set on fire on their faces. Babies were taken from their mother's breast and smashed off walls or stamped on. Good people were beaten murderously and others forced to sing and dance and no matter who they were or how they begged, then came the main activity. The burning, the dead and the living, all hurled into a tar pit that was on fire. They would try to clamber out, being kicked back in as the flesh burnt from their skin. The entire town was surrounded by armed guards, so there was no way to escape. Any of the non-Jewish Poles who tried to hide them or help them, they were thrown onto that tar pit too. And after the mass murder, the nationalists all went back house to house, stealing money and anything of value from those they had dragged out and killed. In many cases, they would take over the houses that were far better than their own, just like the parasites that they were. There are people living in those same houses today, or their families passed them down their family line, all because they murdered the family of the man who had earned such a property. Each time the event was choreographed in exactly the same way, the Jewish people of the town would be lined up in rows of four. The rabbi and the sushet, the butcher in the front, they were given a red banner and ordered to sing and dance as they led their people into the pre-prepared barn. All the way there, these hooligans would bestially beat them up, slash them with knives or drag out an attractive Jewess and she would be gang-raped and shot. Other men played musical instruments loudly to try and cover the screaming of the terror-stricken crowd. By now they knew what was to happen. Some hanged themselves from the beams of the barn. Others sliced into the wrists of their arms and those of their children, even their babies. They were in absolute despair. Anyone trying to fight back would be riddled with machine gun fire. The barn was already doused with kerosene and when they set it alight on the outside, it went up like a torch. And then the nationalists went back robbing their homes and they would find the sick or children hidden and they were dragged out into the street. Kerosene was poured over their heads and they would be set on fire. 
On one occasion, triplets less than a year old were thrown under the cobbles, covered with petrol and burned alive. Some good Poles did what they could. Antonina and Alexander Ryshkovska saved hundreds of Jews, hiding them and getting them out of the country from their small farmhouse in Yankzuko. From early 1942 up until the Russians took back the country in January 1945, they had their lives on the line. And instead of being renowned as heroes, not long after the war ended, they were savagely attacked by local Polish nationalists who had heard that they had defended Jews and they were forced to move closer to the capital, Warsaw, settling in Milanovec. They won huge acclaim from their government and from that of Israel for their incredible courage in the face of what seemed to be impossible odds. After the war, 22 nationalists were arrested and they were found all to be totally uneducated and illiterate. No intelligent person can be racist. They were charged with treason against Poland and one was condemned to death, yet word was leaked that they had all been tortured by the UB, the Polish secret police. And this led to an inquiry funded by rich nationalists spending the fortunes of the Jews they had murdered and robbed. And this leads to another amazing story. It's funny how you begin down one track and suddenly a new track opens up before us. And this is the story of that former police inspector and nationalist who had put the Jedwabney massacre in place. His name was Romano Grossicki. And that was the name that Paola had given to the authorities, for he had given her a form to complete after that Jewess had been shot in the hospital. He was investigated and had three other officers vouch for him, all declaring that they had all fought against the Germans. However, the Celtic thread untangles again in this far-off land. O'Neill, who had reached the rank of sergeant during wartime, said, I took Paula back to Poland in 1947, once travel had started up again. It was a miracle when we found two of her aunties and a cousin still alive, and she was given such a difficult homecoming. We visited the cemetery where her parents were dumped in a mass grave. And as we were walking back through the town of Colman, she screamed on seeing this man in the street. She told me that she was certain that he had been one of the men who had attacked the hospital and according to her parents, had organized the very first barn massacre. When she reacted to him, this piece of shit actually laughed. Paula told me that this man had called her Zid Koshanek, a Jew lover. I lost it and I was about to smack him one but she pulled me back. And later that night in our hotel in Bialystok, as Kolno and Jawabni are fairly close, we ended up talking through the night. The following day, I told her that I had something to do, leaving her to go shopping with her cousin, and she was a bit puzzled, but there were some British soldiers in the Russian sector, and I told her I was going to visit them. I did. And I returned to the hotel late that night, dropped off by three soldiers in a jeep, and the following day, Paula and I got the train back to France and then onwards to Britain. On getting back home, Paula tells me that she had received a letter from her cousin that Grosicki had been found burnt to death in a barn in Colno. Two other men had been beaten to death, but it seemed that he, just he, had been burned alive. My caller said, 
Fortunately, she didn't smell any kerosene on my clothes when I got back to the hotel. And that was when I interjected and said, So you took him out? And O'Reilly replied, All I can say is that what comes around goes around. Some human beings need to be put down. We learnt that from Hitler, surely. He then put the telephone down. Many callers still remind me of this tale. It was an incredible story from a man who seemed to want to offload his conscience. I've checked all of the facts and Grisicki was burned alive. Whether this caller did it or whether he was just taking credit for it, we'll never know. We had callers who were Jewish people ringing into the show thanking him. The majority commending him for righting a great wrong. And one racist called in too, demanding that he be brought to justice. Now I presume this same person rang the police the following day, because later the following afternoon, I received a call from the police asking me to give them the telephone number and the name of the caller, who obviously was still living in the Northeast. Yet, when I looked into my files, for we have to keep them, there was a page missing. I've no idea how that happened. I'm usually so thorough. I mean, after all, I'm a Celt. Now, I think there's just time for a grisly quickie. This is the story of the wicked lady. Now, any movie fan may well remember a fabulous old movie called The Wicked Lady, starring Margaret Lockwood. It was remade very well by Faye Dunaway, both playing the part of Lady Catherine Ferrers, who was greatly loved throughout Hertfordshire until they discovered she was also a highway woman who had robbed thousands of travellers over a period of several years. They say that her ghost still roams around the St Albans area, but the juiciest story of its kind comes from 1965 and actually came to light through a church magazine. I was sent a copy of the report by Malcolm Edwards who'd been a verger in his younger days and having heard one of my radio ghost hunts had decided to share his collection of phenomenal stories with me. But the highlight was this bizarre story from his church magazine. Pretty much all the magazine was taken up by my meeting with spirit and it was sent in by Harry J. Lewis. This is what Harry had to say. As a member of this parish, you will know that we believe in the Holy Spirit, but are forsworn not to have dealings with anything else that we consider ungodly. Well, I came face to face with the ghost of what I believe to be Lady Catherine Ferrers, and I am ashamed to tell that full tale. I was visiting a friend's home, and as it was a sunny day, they suggested a picnic. So we filled a hamper with chicken roll sandwiches, flasks of coffee and lemonade for the two small children. We decided to go to the hill on the outskirts of the city, where they executed the Roman soldier known as Alban in AD 209 for saving the life of a Christian and hiding him in his house. He became Britain's first ever saint. So this was of interest to us, us being Christians. We were lying on the rug from the car when we mused over whether we would be frightened if a ghost of the old Roman should come out to meet us. We decided that we would have nothing to fear, for if the man was a saint in life, he could be nothing less than nice in death. It was at that moment that Douglas, aged seven, came running from a small copse of trees to say that there was a lady in the woods. His mother, my friend's wife, told him to leave the lady alone. At this, Brian, Douglas's brother, chipped in saying, It's great, you can see right through her. 
We thought the 12 year old was merely funning until the seven year old said, I bet she's a ghost lady. So all three adults decided to go with the children and investigate. We hadn't been drinking. None of us are prone to exaggeration, as any of our friends will know. Yet what I'm about to tell you is true. I swear to my Lord God. In the bushes, I saw a lady dressed in a long, fine gown, and she was slowly getting undressed. She appeared solid, and yet from time to time you'd catch a glimpse of light that seemed to just go right through her body. On removing her dress and petticoats, wearing only underwear, she proceeded to put on pantaloons and a grey shirt and jacket. From a bush, she placed a mask over her eyes and added a tricone hat. Then she walked through trees and hedges and disappeared. We all couldn't believe her eyes. And then suddenly, through the thicket, a horse appeared with a rider aboard and it ran completely through us and over the field. We never felt a thing, but the children were laughing and thinking the experience a wonderful one. As for me, I were mortified. I knew we saw a ghost and it flies in the face of all of my beliefs. But all five of us saw the same thing. The phantom seemed not to see us at all. It was as if we weren't there. The only Lady Highwayman known in these parts is Lady Catherine Ferris, and we're all sure that we witnessed a rewinding of history. Perhaps her image was being repeated on the very spot where she readied herself for her criminal exploits. I suppose we'll never know. But a fascinating tale nonetheless. Just some more out of a bottomless pit of grisly tales. And don't forget, if you can support us and make any kind of donation, however little, it would really help us keep this going. And you do that just by going to Robson's World. If you don't want to look at what is in Robson's World, there's a donate button right on the fr on the first page. We'd love it if you could help us in any way, and we need it at the present moment. Also, of course, if you do go to Robson's World, there's a whole ton of stuff that I hope you might like to entertain you through the long evenings if you want to feel the hair on the back of your neck rise and live vicariously through the adventures that you can share. Or just look at some of the dafter things that we've provided for you. There's plenty for you to do. But until next week, look after yourselves for me. And until we are together again from myself, from everybody attached to the Grizzly Tales podcast, we wish you well. <laughs>